Also, I'm going to pop up a poll, and that poll, when it pops up, it's going to ask you how many people are watching this. If you're by yourself, you'll just push one, but if you've got two or three people in the room with you, this gives us kind of an accurate head count of how many people are on this Zoom platform. Uh, this is new to Scott and I for sure. So I'm going to pop this poll up, and I'm going to launch it. And all you got to do is just answer it. Uh, how many people's watching with you? What this does, this just gives us a, this just gives us an accurate count of the number of people that's on this meeting. As most of you know, we try to do monthly meetings, uh, the White Van Buren Extension Office in conjunction with the White Van Buren Cattlemen's Association. We try our best to put on monthly meetings and we've got meetings scheduled for every month throughout the, this year, 2021. Uh, but until COVID dies down, we might have to, uh, we might have to do the platform through this Zoom setting. Our next meeting is gonna be February the 11th. And we've got Dr. Andrew Griffin from the University of Tennessee gonna to be talking about the uh, coal cow market. So be looking for that, be looking for that email. We've also got some other uh, Zoom meetings scheduled and I'm gonna put them in the chat. Uh, if you're interested in them, you just write down the, uh, you write down the URLs and join if you would like to as the meeting goes on. I'm gonna let Scott, I'm gonna let Scott at this time introduce uh, Dr. Arnold. Good evening, everyone. Uh, certainly glad to have everybody on board. Uh, this is a sort of a new process for Chris and I. Uh, we've been trained by uh, Professor Hicks there. He's, he's an expert at all this, all things uh, as far as Zoom. So hopefully if we have any problems, uh, we'll be able to uh, phone a friend or something, maybe get through this. But uh, we're very fortunate to start our 2021 uh, calendar of, of beef meetings and stuff with, with uh, what we think is going to be a great program. Uh, started reaching out to uh, Dr. Arnold early October trying to get this set up as a face-to-face -face meeting. That was our intent at the time. But as you know, and Chris mentioned, you know, it, it just worked out that we're gonna to have to have uh, some of our meetings early on this year for sure in the Zoom format. So we're fortunate to have Dr. Michelle Arnold with us. She's with the University of Kentucky. And we'll go ahead and tell you now, I've seen the, the cover slide on this, on this presentation and it's gonna look blue on your, on your screen. And uh, you know, she's the University of Kentucky and we've already got after her about that. But, uh, you know, I guess we'll do the best we can. But uh, she's a ruminant extension veterinarian. She works at the uh, diagnostic lab there at the University of Kentucky. She's a native of Louisville, Kentucky, and re received her uh, her vet degree. She graduated from vet school at University of Tennessee in 1990. Uh, after that, she started a, a veterinary career and practice there in Sweetwater. A lot of her calls, she says, was uh, around dairy working with dairy cattle, and she launched a solo animal practice in 1991. About 95% of those calls were dairy related. Uh, she did some equine and small ruminant as well. Uh, says in 1997, she became the part owner of a 100 cow Holstein dairy that later converted to a beef cow calf operation. Uh, she's also operated a feeder calf weaning and preconditioning facility that handled approximately 400 calves a year. Uh, on intensively grazed forages. She's uh, got a lot of expertise in beef cattle. We've asked her tonight to talk mainly about uh, the feet structure and problems associated with the feet and the udder system. And so hopefully, uh, uh, you know, y'all pay attention, feel free to ask questions. We'll be doing the questions through the chat feature. If you're not familiar with that on the bottom of your screen, if you use your mouse and get down toward the bottom, it's gonna have a chat area there. You can click on that. It'll open up a box where you can type in your question. And uh, so you just like send it a text message. And Chris and I will handle all those, uh, all those questions and stuff from our end. We're gonna do about, I think, probably 45 minutes of presentation. We'll keep all of our questions to the end. We have muted everyone. So, uh, you know, just uh, 
If you have a question, be sure and pop it in the chat box. This time, we'll turn it over to Dr. Arnold. Thank you, Scott. And uh, he, he set the bar pretty high for me today. He, he really, he said I had to do a good job. There are a lot of people on that knew me, so I've tried, tried my best to put this a good presentation together. <clears throat> Let me go ahead and share my screen and make sure everything's working like it's supposed to. Can you see that? Okay. Is it coming up? Yes, yes, ma'am. We see it fine. Great. Um, so I will I will probably go ahead and um take off my video for the fact that just it saves some bandwidth on my side. So hopefully we won't have any um any problems with the computer. We're not getting a picture on this side. Uh oh. You're not? No. Black screen. Hmm. Let's see. Your screen sharing is paused, it says, for some reason. Okay. Resume share. Good? No. Hmm. I can see it fine. Yeah, I can, I can see it well. Yeah, we can't see it here. Who, where where is here um rock island i'm not getting your uh, what are you getting anything at all <clears throat> i'm getting a black screen mm -hmm. that says my microphone is unmuted and my mm -hmm. video has stopped and that may be on your end um with i'm not sure Everybody else okay? Because I think it may be something just maybe individual. We can see it on our end. All right. So I think uh, you might might try to, to log off and log back in. Sometimes that works um, if your video is, has quit. But I'll go ahead okay. and get started. If everybody can see okay and can hear all right. Um, <clears throat> As you heard in the introduction, my name is Dr. Michelle Arnold. This is a picture of our diagnostic lab up here in Lexington. Um, I've, I've been in a lot of, lot of uh, different aspects of veterinary medicine. This one is a very unique um, role because I'm here where we do all the necropsies and so I'm kind of the go-between between, between um, all the pathologists and, the, and all the labs here and, and the veterinarians out in the field as well as the producers. So, Spend lots of time on the phone, um, taking histories, talking to producers, also talking to veterinarians. It's, it's a fascinating job, to be honest about it. Um, and there is something new, it seems like, every day. So, so that's really good. Um, just, just in case you didn't see it on the slide, there will be no discussion of UK basketball while, uh, while we're doing this webinar, because this year has just been a, a, a mess. So we're gonna just, just ignore that. Okay, so when I was putting this talk together it, it, about, about feet and about uh, udder, it, it comes back to developing a calling order. I did a talk on that um, a, a couple of years ago. And it's, it's, it's very important in terms of, of um, you know, if they're going to survive in your herd, if they're going to last. So I, I always put this position at the top. I like to get rid of crazy cows, uh, open females. And then the third on my list is structural soundness and that would be feet, legs, and udder. So structural soundness, of course, bad feet or claws, eye problems, uh, poor udder conformation, uh, history of vaginal prolapse, things of that nature would be my structural, structural problems that would put a cow on a list to be sold. So we're going to talk tonight about both udder problems and, um, and feet. So I'm not going to get too deep into a lot of, the, a lot of uh, treatment. And mostly I just want you to think about recognizing these things, looking for these problems, and, and start, to, start to work it into your, um, to your thought process, especially uh, if you're calving right now. Um, if you're going to buy, if you're purchasing any new animals, 
the take a look at the udder. It seems to be one of those things that is ignored uh, for the most part in beef cattle. And it's so important because it's, this is your milk delivery system. You know, we put so much emphasis on colostrum and milk production that, and we, we don't think about the fact that if she has plenty of milk, but has, but the calf can't nurse, you know, that's a problem. Um, so uh, you see this picture on the right, uh, the cow with the great big funnel shaped teeth and a calf, a newborn could not get a hold of that, that rear teeth uh, whatsoever. So, you know, that type of situation where you have a very large teeth that doesn't get milked out is a, is a perfect place for mastitis to set up because it's not getting milked out. <clears throat> On the, on the left hand side of, that, uh, of this um, screen is a picture that, that this, this cow only has two functional teats or two rear. The two front teats are, are dry. She probably had mastitis at some point in time. And uh, you know, it's, it's dried up completely. It's just scar tissue. So you know, this, is, this is an important consideration on how big her calf can get. I mean, it's limited to that milk production. So always think about these, these few questions down there. Can the calf nurse? I mean, is it possible or is the udder too low? Uh, or is the, are the teats in the wrong shape? Uh, second question, does she have milk? You know, is, is the cow going to produce milk or not? Um, I, get, I get so many um, calves in here to the lab that, that die because they start. You know, basically they starved to death and it's, they just didn't recognize what was happening. And, and are they prone to mastitis? You know, does this, this udder confirmation make them, make them more likely to get an infection in a quarter? So from, again, this is the milk delivery system. So milk production in beef cows is the most important factor affecting calf pre-weaning growth and subsequent body weight at weaning. Uh, this was a, a study done by Steve Nickerson down at the University of Georgia. He said he found in his study each additional pound of milk produced per day may increase calf pre-weaning weight 15 to 30 pounds, which sounds like a lot to me. But but nonetheless, the idea is the more milk they get when they're when they're young, it's going to put on a more frame, more condition. So the, the Beef Improvement uh, Federation has actually come up with a scoring system for, um, for the udder and teats. It has, it's, two, it's got a two score system. And so one of them is suspension, which is how, and of course, how low it hangs and how it's hanging. And then the teat size itself. And it ranges from one to, uh, one to nine, because the lower scores uh, are, are worse. You know, the lower the score, the worse the other. Um, <clears throat> it's best they, they um, recommend that you do all of your scoring within the first 24 hours of calving in order to get a really good idea of what, a, what that udder looks like when it's full. So another um, part about suspension, you know, this we, we teat size, let me get back just a second here. Teat size is pretty easy to understand. You know, that's just, are they, are they, uh, how big around, how far down they hang. Um, but udder suspension has to do with, is the udder level? You know, it, are, are the teats hanging down below the hocks? Are they so low that they actually drag through the mud? Um, so that's the, that's the difference there in that scoring system. So the udder suspension looking at rear view, that median suspensory ligament, which is, which is the, the line, they have it represented as a, as a straight up and down line in the, in the udder. That ligament is what ties the udder to the body. So over time with age, and if that ligament weakens, so that allows the udder to hang down more and also for the, for the teats to kind of splay out to the side. So it's one of the things we look for in when we're looking at suspension is looking at them from the rear as well. 
The University of Nebraska has put out an excellent guide to this, a guide to utter and teach scoring beef cows. Uh, there's the, the web address in order to reach, uh, to, get to, that, um, to get to that publication. Really goes through it carefully. I think Rick Rasby is the, is the person that wrote it. Goes through the scoring carefully and how, how to do it correctly. So that's a very good resource to, to have. So udder and teat size are both heritable. Our um, genetics specialist at UK is Dr. Dare Bullock. Uh, a couple of years ago, we wrote an article together about beef cattle mastitis. And he did the he did the genetics part, obviously, and I did the I did the veterinary part. But this was his his um, what what he quoted about udders. He said udder score and beef cattle are considered to be moderately heritable, and so two scores are typically taken on beef cows: suspension and teat size. Heritability for suspension: 0 0.32, 0 0.28 for teat size. So this was kind of the bottom line of what um, he wanted to convey was what these values tell us is that females with good or bad udders tend to pass that trait to their daughters. From a practical standpoint, if you have a cow with an undesirable udder, it might not be feasible to call her, but you definitely want to avoid retaining your daughters as replacements. Now the same idea with bull, when you're purchasing herd bulls, you intend to retain daughters from, it's a good idea to take a look at his dam and assess her udder quality. It's, you know, you don't, it's, it's not necessary to be too selective, but if you want to avoid, you want to avoid a bull from a dam that has extremely poor udder quality. So it is heritable. Look at, if the dam is, is, has an ugly udder, she's going to pass that on. So many of the problems we see, a lot of the pictures I see of, of, of um, poorly scoring udders are in teats are in Herefords. Um, I, I love Herefords, but they do have some problems uh, <clears throat> with eyes and with teats. So both, both uh, areas they're working on. So they're one breed that's actually going into to udder scoring, um, trying to keep keep track of those and, and improve their genetics on, on their udders. Same thing with eyes, they're, they're starting to do some pictures and, and for pigment, pigment in the eye to hopefully decrease pink eye. So one of the things that, that we don't think about in beef cattle, we think about in dairy a lot, um, but beef cattle get this too is mastitis. So two kind of different situations here. One of them is what we call summer mastitis, where the horn flies bite the teat ends. If you use good fly control, this is not a problem. But I had a, a producer a couple of years ago that did not use any fly control whatsoever because he said it made him sick when he poured it on. And so um, ended up having an entire group of heifers with very deformed, Teats, a lot of them didn't have teat openings, um, with a lot of damage from these horn flies biting the teat ends. The other thing we deal with with beef cattle and mastitis is, and I alluded to this before, those cows with big funnel shaped teats, or they have udders that drags through the mud, um, or they've got blind quarters already, they're at a really high risk to develop mastitis again. Uh, if they haven't had it, if they haven't had it once, they probably will get it. Uh, and that's just if a fact of uh, having the bacteria are able to get up in there. They got a perfect medium to grow in milk. So, um, and this happens again frequently, not maybe not frequently, but enough that I need to mention it, that I hear this from, from producers. My, my newborn calf is nursing constantly, but it keeps getting weaker and weaker and weaker. Um, and so I had one producer that lost about three calves. I finally went out there to see because I, I just couldn't find anything that was, that was going on with the calf. And then looked at the cow, looked at, and this was, that year was so muddy. Looked at the cow, she's got one huge, Teeth, one huge quarter, which was mastitis, 
The other three are basically dry, which happens a lot. If they have a bad case of mastitis, the other three quarters are not, are not producing anything. So in a situation like that, um, calf basically starved to death. So you gotta be careful. You gotta be careful and make sure if a calf is sick or it's weak, always look at the dam too. She's half of the equation. Here's a couple of examples of this summer mastitis with the horn flies. And these horn flies, we see them on the back, but they also get down around the udder and, they, and on the teats themselves. So uh, that first picture on the left is just an overall picture of the horn flies on the teeth. But the second one and the one in the middle is where you actually see the scabs, where they've been biting on the teeth and stuck in, you know, stuck in blood out of there and they leave, <clears throat> leave a little injury. And then the, the picture on the far right is actually the damage you'll see. So that, that teat on the left hand side is that quarter's dry. There's nothing in there. Um, she's been damaged, had mastitis, it's all scar tissue. So just that the quarter on that right side is okay, but the, the one on the left is definitely dry. So horn flies, just, I like this, I like this slide. I put it in here because uh, Dr. Townsend used to be our, our uh, um, insect guy here. He's retired now, but this was his slide. So horn flies, you, we're, we try to control them. They're, they're difficult to, so I like to put that in there and say, as exceptional control, you still have some flies. You know, you still have some, and an acceptable level is 100 to 200 horn flies per head is about where you really want to make sure you're starting to get some control, control measures. So let's switch gears to feet. I think there's more, there's more to the, the, the foot problems than there are to the udder problems. The udder, we just need to start opening, start thinking about it, thinking about um, you know, milk production and the delivery to the calf. But now feet are a different story. So um, three pictures here of terrible looking feet. The one on the left, top left is a, is a founder or laminitis. The one on the top right is uh, what we call sand crack. So those vertical, vertical fissures. Um, and actually I don't talk much about those vertical cracks, but that is an indication of poor mineral supplementation. If you see that, you're not, the, the cattle are not getting what they need in terms of mineral. And the um, picture on the bottom is what we call corkscrew claw or screw claw, where the, the outer claw is actually growing faster and kind of turning up. And we'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. So this would be a cutaway of a normal rear claw. And let me find my pointer. It's not there, probably. Maybe it's here. Whoa! <laughs> Sorry about that. Looking for my pointer. There it is. Okay, laser pointer. So what we have here is the is this is the sole. This is what they actually bear weight on. You have a subcutaneous layer right here at the toe. And then a fat pad that FP is just fat back in this area right here. You got some tendons that are running up along the back of the, of the hook. Um, let's see, you've got, this is the, I'm going to show you this P3 here, this triangle. That's actually the, the, the bone. That is the third bone in the in the foot. And that's the one that we, we talk about a lot because it's the one that tends to get abscesses in it or with founder, it rotates. So that's a really important bone, that P3. And then that TA right there, terminal arch, that's just the blood supply that goes into it. <clears throat> and then this uh, JS here is a joint space. It's a joint space between that's P2 and this is P3. So uh, that joint space is a great place to set up for infection and arthritis.
some some rules of thumb when dealing, and this is kind of um, the things you'll you'll mostly be dealing with as a producer, because you're gonna see one that's lame and try to figure out you know where do I go from here. So oftentimes lameness can be categorized according to, to just looking at the at the at the foot and looking at the swelling of the soft tissue. Um, that interdigital necrobacillosis uh, is a very fancy term for foot rot. So foot rot, which is very common, one of the most common things we see, it is always centered, um, centered in the foot. So, and there's always a lot of swelling, but it's very symmetrical. And I'll show you some pictures of that coming up. If it progresses on, or if there's um, some type of injury or, or puncture wound, to the hoof so that there's a deep infection. We call that deep sepsis of the digit. Um, there is still a lot of swelling, but it tends not to be symmetrical. It is more, it's on the side of wherever the, the infection is located. So one thing to, to bear in mind on lameness treatments, on-farm lameness treatment should include an expected deadline for it to resolve. So if you decide you're going to treat, uh, you're going to treat one that's lame, have it have a date in your mind or a deadline. If this animal's not better by such and such day, I'm calling the vet because the the longer they go, the worse things get. Um, and I'll show you that soon. Uh, cattle that become lame from a wound, especially if it's a puncture wound. Probably you need to go ahead and get a vet out as soon as possible. Those that are punctures deep into the hoof uh, generally need a little more care. They're going to have to be pared out and cleaned out so they have a drainage, you know, a way to drain. So assessment of swelling. Um, first thing you can do, of course, you, the nice thing when you've got, uh, you're looking at at hooves is you've always got two. You've got two to look at. You've got your abnormal one and the normal. So the normal is on the, on the left, abnormal on the right. First thing you can see, I mean, this is obviously swollen, swollen here. Uh, the dew claws are far apart, much farther than over here. Um, <clears throat> but then you can look at, uh, is this symmetrical? And what I mean by symmetrical, you and think about drawing a line straight up the leg like this and say, is it the same? Is it the same on both sides or not? So, or you can look at the width of the heel bulbs too to see if there's a difference. This is not the best picture in the world. It's a little bit blurry, but, but in this case, it's not symmetrical. It's much, much worse over here on this side because then this, this animal in particular had, a, had an infection over on the right side of the of the hook. So deep structures, we talk about deep digital sepsis is when, and again, this is not a great, great picture, but I have some better ones coming. Uh, asymmetrical swelling, more so on one side than the other. Um, <clears throat> big swollen foot, usually extremely, extremely painful. And this one is usually where you're going to have to have some veterinary intervention if it's going to get better. And these are very difficult to treat. Very, very difficult to cure. Okay, so foot rot. Again, this is the one that, that we're all pretty, pretty familiar with, right? Acute lameness, really sore. They used to just barely put their toe down when they walk. <clears throat> with redness and swelling starts in that, this is the, what we call the inner digital space. It's in between the two digits. So right in here <clears throat> and it extends upward. So you've got, uh, again, symmetrical swelling. This is pretty well the same, right? On both sides, they're, they're equally swollen. Got a lot of swelling right here around the coronary band and, and on up. Um, you've got these deep cracks in here. And there's usually a pretty bad smell. It's moist, it's painful. Uh, these are gram negative bacteria and they're anaerobic, which is, means they're gonna stink. Um, they're almost always Fusobacterium necrophorum is the predominant bacteria in there. 
And the only reason that's important to you is to know what antibiotics to treat with, um, which I'll talk about here just in a second. So why does it happen? Warm, moist environmental conditions doesn't really have to be warm, but it definitely needs to be moist. Um, but but in when it's really hot, obviously cattle will congregate and defecate in shady, wet areas. But this time of year, if you're getting a lot of rain and mud, uh, same situation. You get that softening of the interdigital skin just because it stays moist. And um, sometimes that is simply a fact that the conformation of that of that hoof. Some of them are really tight. Those, those two, the two claws kind of stay together tight and they just don't dry out very well. And then some type of trauma, rocks, stubble, twigs, frozen ground, you name it, whatever it can hit on that soft skin actually has, tears it, tears it and creates a, creates a, like a laceration or a fissure. And then you get contamination of that skin and, then, and the infection. <clears throat> so a couple other shots, this one on the left, very, really typical presentation. Again, some symmetrical swelling, big, big swollen foot, don't want to put it down and they'll barely put their toe down. And one on the right kind of shows that deep fissure, the deep crack where the infection is. We talked a little bit earlier, I was talking with Scott about how do you know the difference between a, a hoof lesion and one that's further up in the leg. So, and that it was a really good question. Most, most of the time lameness is in the foot, but we do get injuries uh, up, at, up in the higher structures of the leg. So the best way I know to do it is when you watch them walk. When you watch them walk, if, if, it's, if it's up in the leg, they will still plant the foot down. Usually they'll put the foot flat on the ground and then pull it up really quickly. Like they, they'll put the foot, but, but it, they put it down flat and then they'll pull it up quickly because there's something up in the leg that hurts, but not in the, but not in the foot. So if it's a foot problem though, they'll just barely put that toe down or maybe not put it down at all, but they'll try to, try to keep it off of the ground. So just kind of watch them walk. Um, it, it takes a little practice to get used to that and just watching their gait, but you can usually figure it out. So we really talk about, um, I really push treatment, early treatment of foot rot cases because it can advance. You know, if, if they, if only about, 15%, I think I read, of foot rot cases will clear on their own. So they need treatment and they're simple to treat with antibiotics. But if we don't do it, if we don't get in there and, and get to it, um, then those, that, um, that infection tends to go in deeper. It goes into the bones, it goes in the ligaments, the synovial structures, sometimes one or both sides. So again, that, that would be your deep sepsis. So here's a nice, nice picture of a hoof here that started out as, as foot rot and has now become much, much worse, much more difficult to treat. And this one's a bad one on us. This was a, a, a steer on a UK feeding project. This was several years ago. He was on a feeding trial, get really, really close to the um, end of the trial. And we had to end up euthanizing him because if you take a look at that rear hoof, he, uh, it, it started as a foot rot. They treated it and they kind of ignored it, thought it would get better, but it didn't. And it got worse and worse. And finally, it, it got to where he was non-weight bearing and was starting to lose weight. So at that point, we put him down. So this was a close-up on the right of what his what his hoof looked like. He was very swollen, uh, swollen really all the way up the leg. So on the left, I took a we took the bandsaw and cut you know, cut the the hoof to see where all the infection was. So if you remember that normal picture, so here's P3 right here. Whoops, sorry, right there that triangle. So that's 
that's the bone right here. And where the infection came in, it basically ate up all this tissue. Everything that's black, um, kind of reddish black, all of this here has just been eaten up by the bacteria. And so lots of swelling, uh, lots of what we call necrosis, where it's just rotten. So that's why we, we really push. Get, get, them, get them treated early because once you get bacteria into these structures, especially when they start getting into the tendon sheath and into the bone, <clears throat> it's doggone hard to turn it around. We just, you just can't get enough medicine down there to do it. And you say, well, we could maybe get in there and open it up, pair it out and drain it. But especially with beef cattle, where are you gonna keep them that's clean? You know, they have to be kept clean, bandaged, rebandaged. It becomes much more difficult uh, to manage. So things that look similar to foot rot, but are not, if they have a laceration or cut from something, I've seen glass uh, stuck in there before, uh, rocks get stuck up in there sometimes. Um, so that'd be your form body penetrating wound. Uh, dermatitis of an interdigital fibroma, that's a corn basically. Sometimes corns, um, uh, sometimes those corns, which they just look like almost like a thumb, right there between the, the claws, they will sometimes get cuts in them that look very similar to uh, foot rot. Hairy heel warts, not so much. I've got a picture of that coming up, but uh, there's usually no generalized swelling with those. So treatment, or again, early treatment's key. Safety of here, that would be your Naxel, Xenel exceed are all the the three that were are safety of cure, and these are the these are the antibiotics that are actually labeled for foot rot. It would be the the Naxel exceed Xenel Nuflor, Oxytetracycline, Draxin, uh, Tylen. All those actually have written on the label that they will work against foot rot. My, my favorite all-time drug for foot rot is penicillin. It's easy and cheap, but it is what we call extra label. So your vet needs to tell you to use it, um, is, which we can do. We can tell you that, yeah, you can use penicillin on there and give you a dose that will work. So I do like penicillin a lot. It, it, it's very good against gram-negative organisms and excellent against anaerobes. So that's why it typically works really well. Uh, optional on foot rot cases, cleaning it, bandaging the hoof. If you're in there early and get it treated, probably none of that is necessary. Just the antibiotics should take care of it. Um, but if you do that, if you can get in there and clean it and bandage it, it gener generally will clear up quickly. Okay, corkscrew claw is another one of these that we see pretty frequently. In, in beef cattle. So this is a genetic heritable problem. And that's, so you wanna keep an eye on this if you got, if you're purchasing bulls, um, definitely don't wanna get a bull that, that has this problem. Not only because he's gonna pass it on, but secondly, I mean, bulls really, really rely on their feet, especially their rear feet for breeding. So you don't wanna have any kind of problem in, in, in the, in the feet of or legs of your bulls. Um, so with this corkscrew claw, they bear weight on the outer wall. Um, so right here, you can see that um, that this outer, it's usually, it's on the outside, almost always on the rear legs. So <clears throat> this outside claw grows a little bit faster and it's narrower. And then it also has this upward turn. It's got an upward spiral. And um, they tend to bear all their weight right about there. You know, not on the sole. This is the sole where they should be walking. Instead, they walk on that um, back here on the heel. This is a little bit closer picture of, a, of the screw claw. So this one's been trimmed, but you can see they put a lot of weight right in here. This is where they should be bearing their weight. And it's not, it's not. <laughs> This is where they're doing it right here. 
Um, and that toe, again, is kind of turning over and crossing over the other the other um, claw. So abnormal claw formation, if they got a shallow toe angle, low heels, small narrow claw, things like that are genetic, you know, gen and, and then they, they're worse, they get worse with certain environments and management. So then the problem is heritable can be worse with certain situations. Digital dermatitis, this is that, or what you call a hairy heel wart. This has become a major, major lead problem in feedlots. Um, used to see it almost exclusively in dairy, and now it's, it's starting to hit in um, a lot of the feedlots out west, especially if they have wet, muddy pens, which most of them do, um, most of them do this time of year. Uh, so they get these these circular lesions, it's right above the, the heel bulbs. Not all of them have those little hairy-like projections. Some of them are just flat, some are just red, raised, really painful. They're very painful when they walk. Um, these can be treated with, I mean, treated with a, best way to treat them is with a foot bath, but you can also spray like topical, topical tetracycline on there, and we usually control these. Um, but you can imagine in a feedlot and a great big pen with many of them affected, it's a big problem um, trying to come up with a foot bath and run a bunch of steers through. So hairy heel warts are caused by a, an organism and bacteria called a treponema. Uh, kind of, and they're similar to lepto. They're a spiral, from a spiral shaped bacteria. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's an emerging problem in, in feedlots. And I have seen some odd cases of this digital dermatitis where uh, it actually went up the leg. It actually went up to about the knee. Um, really strange looking. And that's why I got the pictures and they biopsied it. Definitely that's what it was. So it can, I mean, it can grow past that, that spot. Um, laminitis founder, this is a, a nice shot of both. It's a little bit of corkscrew claw and a little bit of founder uh, rolled into one. So you get these long, long um, claws. They, they kind of like a ski jump. You know, they've got um, that concave structure, lots of horizontal fissures, you see the horizontal cracks and ridges. Um, really long, they grow out very quickly. So laminitis or founder, why do they get that way? You know, it, most of you are probably familiar with horses that founder and how painful they get. Well, cattle can go that way, but most of the time our um, laminitis cases are subclinical. We don't see them occurring, uh, but it's, it's due to acidosis. And it's usually a subacute acidosis where we've given them too much grain, all, uh, or change their diet dramatically, giving them something that um, is rapidly fermentable, drops that rumen pH quickly, and then they get uh, what we call metabolic acidosis. And you say, well, how's that got to do with the feet? Well, it alters blood flow. It actually does alter the blood flow to the hoof. And those structures down there are really intricate in the way that they're supplied, their blood supply. So it, it changes the hemodynamics of it, basically. They get some, they get some thrum, they get some clots down in there, they get um, just poor circulation to the hoof, and the structures begin to die. They, they have some necrosis, they got lots of inflammation. So, and so you got lots of changes going on in the hoof. And what happens is that P3, that the triangle shaped bone at the end, it actually will start to turn and it'll, it will kind of sink down and the toe will stick straight up. And then the, it starts to grow that way. And that's why we see those abnormally shaped hooves. So well, here's a good one. This is a steer uh, that is foundered. Uh, you see the big, long, flat, uh, square-toed 
you can't really see the ridges very well. All four hooves affected in this one. So just think too much grain, too much grain too quickly and not enough effective fiber. You know, not enough fiber to make them chew, make them produce saliva, which is a good buffer. Um, one thing that we consistently see here in the lab is um, we'll see a grain overload or carbohydrate overload from finely ground corn. Lots of people like to feed their own corn, which is fine, and they grow, feed their own, mix their own, but they grind it up like hog feet. I mean, it is nothing but powder. And remember when, when cattle, when they digest, when they ferment this feed, the bacteria grab on to the corn. And so if it's in, if it's a powder, think about all the surface area those bacteria have. They can literally digest that corn just so quickly that it drops that room in pH very quickly. So you don't really want finely ground. You cracked, yes, you know, you talk, but but not not so ground up, especially when you're first introducing it in the diet. That can be a real problem. So we had a, I put this recent case in here. It was interesting. Um, I get these a lot where people send me emails with a question. So I'll show you the pictures here. She is, she's Angus about four weeks ago. She began limping, 13 year old cow. We thought it was her hip. So we got her up hoping just to sell her. But the limping was worse. It was her lower foot, top of the hoof. They gave her LA 300, <clears throat> didn't see a response. They called the vet. Evidently, I'm not sure the vet came out, but he said we purchased a dose of Draxin from him. She still hasn't shown much improvement. We've also read about iodine in their diets. Um, and would we need to add more? And said it's swollen at the top of her hoof. She's eating good, eats her feed. Um, just the split is swollen. She does not like to use it at all. So they sent me some pictures. Here's the cow. She does look really good, I think, for a 13-year-old cow. <clears throat> so here are the pictures of her hoof. And you see that this side is, is very swollen. Kind of got a little spot right here that's not looking good. It looks like maybe that's where an abscess is uh, starting to kind of just right in there. It's been getting a little bit soft, like possibly there's going to be um, uh, pus come out of there at some point. So that was on November 3rd. They sent me another one on the 10th and about a week later you see how much bigger that is. So you've got some pus that's definitely come up in this in this right above the coronary vein. So you know, it, it, that's the coronary band right around there. So whatever, some, well when you have infection in the hoof, sometimes what it does is it actually comes up and tries to pop out here because it's it's found it's found some soft tissue. Really can't come out there where the hoof is too hard. So it kind of migrates up. We, in, in horses, we call it graveling. An abscess will gravel up and will finally pop out here above, right above the coronary band. So that was on the 10th. They sent me one on the 1st of December. Uh, it's kind of crooked there, but still that same same spot. She said this cow's hoof started having something coming out of it. It was whitish looking, which was pus. But now there's a big ball at the top of the hoof. Uh, do you think it will bust open? She really isn't getting any better. We're keeping feed and water close to her. And then, you know, this is a pretty typical problem. So what do you, what do you do, you know, at this point? Some of them will, you know, some of those abscesses are gonna rupture and the pus will come out and they do okay. Uh, others have infection that's actually down in the bone or down in the joint. So even if some pus does come out, they're just too painful. They are too painful to recover. And in this case, you know, this is an older cow. Um, she never did recover. Even though she had some discharge, a little bit of the pus came out, that foot was just too far. I mean, it was too far gone that the deeper structures were affected. So they ended up having to euthanize her. 
Um, couple, one thing about if, if any of you have feeder, ca feeder calves, this is another problem we, we have. Um, in feedlot cattle, especially, <clears throat> especially early in the feeding period, if you don't properly bed the trailers for transport, you know, if you're sending calves out west, uh, make sure you chip those trailers and chip them well, because um, this is where they start this, this, this problem called toe tip necrosis. So um, make sure you bed trailers for transport. Uh, you know, remember they're going on to concrete surfaces. It, it can be pretty tough on some of these feeder calves that are coming straight off of ground, you know, grass and mud basically, and then going on to concrete uh, because it's just totally different for that hook. Um, it's a separation of the white line right up there at the toe and they get an, uh, an abscess formation there. So right about in there um, is where we see these problems with the, the toe tip in, uh, in these feeder calves. Make sure they're on a good plane of mineral. Again, make sure if you're shipping them, you got them chipped really well. And if you can start getting them on concrete and let them spend a little time toughen up those hooves before they go is also another good thing to kind of prevent some of these, some of these problems. Well, that's all I have. There's my contact information. It's michelle.arnold at uky.edu. And um, I'll go ahead and stop sharing and you can see if there's any questions in the chat. Let me check and see. Hey, that's a super good job. A lot of uh, very visual images and stuff. Uh, <laughs> I hope nobody was eating supper. <laughs> Remember, if you've got any questions and stuff uh, about specifics related to the, the udder or any of those feet issues and stuff, you can just go down to the bottom of your screen, uh, click on the chat, it'll open up, and you can just type, type right in there a question if you've got one. And uh, One thing I, I did, I failed to mention is that balanced trace mineral, just making sure that, that that's always available, the selenium, the copper, the zinc, uh, so many of these trace minerals are, are incredibly important for, for um, overall health, not just hoof health. But the thing that you need to remember is don't offer additional salt. Don't offer a salt block on the side. Don't offer um, your minerals cafeteria style and figure that, you know, if they need it, they're gonna eat it. Cattle are not like that. They are drawn to one thing and that is salt. So if you offer salt separately from your trace mineral, they are not gonna eat your trace mineral like you should. So always remember not to have that out. Um, so Dr. Arnold, we, have a, uh, we do have a question. Uh, the question is what role does crossbreeding have in preventing foot problems? Of course, crossbreeding is, is excellent to help a lot of problems. We'd have to have Dare here. We'd have to have Dr. Bullock here to really be able to answer that with authority. You know, I know he, he is a, a big advocate of crossbreeding. I'm sure it would, be, would, uh, it, it would be effective. I'm not sure to what degree. The, another question is with uh, genetic abnormal claw formations, mm -hmm. uh, what do you recommend we do with the cow given that it could be past its offspring? Would you say cull it? I would, I would cull her, yes. You, know, you think about these, these corkscrew claws are just one example. If they're going to be mobile, you're almost going to have to have retrimmed. Trimmed at some point, try to do some corrective trimming. And that is not the goal with beef cattle. We try to treat them as a herd. When they start becoming individuals, it's a problem. Because then you got to call a vet and you got to have somebody out there to, to trim her, or, or, you know, the bull or the, or, or the cow, whichever. And it's a big job and it usually has to be done yearly. So I have, I'm an advocate to get rid of anything that has a, a, a torque screw claw. So we, we got another one that says occasionally we get founder in our strictly grass-fed cows. Really? Thoughts on what would be causing that? 
Yeah, and that was like that, what I was talking about, the effect of fiber. When you get really good pasture and it's high protein and it's really vegetative, um, they don't make a lot of slobber. They don't make much saliva, but they don't need you. And it's moist, um, so they tend to, they tend to get, um, not produce nearly enough saliva to, to buffer. You know, that's what your spit's for, is it, it buffers the rumen. Uh, and so without that, you really lose a lot of your buffering capacity. So to change that situation, if it's really good, high quality, forage, vegetative, not stemmy, you better offer some stemmy hay. And it's probably a good idea to make them eat it. You know, maybe when they're hungry, have them eat some hay first before they go out to pasture. Or another thing is to limit their time on the pasture to just maybe an hour or so. And when they, when they're finished, they're finished grazing, get them off of there. So it's, um, it's so they're not getting so much. The other thing is to wait until the dew is dry. That makes a big difference, actually, in terms of their saliva production. You know, if the, if the grass is dry, then they will produce a whole lot more saliva. So you mentioned, I got another question. So you were talking about your mineral. Uh, I've got a producer here that keeps high mag supreme mineral from co-op and they mm -hmm. mix it with salt in a four to one mix. Mm -hmm. So what's your thoughts on mixing that salt with that high mag? The, so trace minerals that are free choice, should have a dose, should have a number of ounces per head per day consumption written on there. It should say, this, your, your cattle should consume four ounces per head per day or three ounces per head per day, depending on which mineral it is. Figure it out, figure out how much they are supposed to eat, how many heads you got, how quickly they ought to go through a bag. So if they're, if they're going through bags really quickly, way past, way faster than they should be, cutting it with a little salt will slow them down. That, that's a very acceptable way to do it. But you don't wanna cut their consumption so much that they're not getting their daily need. So there, there's some other ways, you know, if you wanna cut their consumption, you can also move it away from water. That's one of the little tricks that'll slow down their consumption. But um, just you just got to make sure they at least get that what they're supposed to on a daily basis. All right, Dr. Arnold, we uh, that's all the questions that I see in chat. We sure do appreciate you joining us this uh, this evening. Uh, it was a lot of really good information. I think I'm going to go back home and check my cow herd. Uh, I got a few limping. I'm going to see what <laughs> I want to see what's going on with them. <laughs> Uh, Make sure you treat them. Treat them early. Uh, to our producers out there, be looking because, like I said, we're going to uh, Scott and I are going to going to do one of these once a month, like we normally did. Except this will be a Zoom setting. Also, the Upper Cumberland Extension team has got some upcoming upcoming Zoom presentations that we're going to be emailing out to you. Uh, if you see of them, any of them that's interesting to you, sign on. If not, then pass it and go to the next one. Uh, our next one coming up is going to be January 21st, and it's going to be on athletic fields. And then on February the 11th, we're going to do the coal cow market. And then on February the 16th, we're going to have a beekeeping Zoom. So just be on the lookout for those uh, coming in your emails. And we really appreciate everybody signing on. And uh, have a good evening. Thanks, guys. We'll see you. Thank you, Dr. Arnold.